And Father, we thank you that you've given us life. And more than life, you've given us a way to live life. Help us by the power of your word to experience all that you have for us, God, to, to ring out of this life every last bit of service that you have for us, every last bit of love that you have for us, every last bit of your plan, God. We want to follow it to the T. So help us, God, to understand your word. Sometimes, God, we read it and it's like beyond us. We just don't get it. So we need you, Holy Spirit. Your word says that you will lead and guide us into all truth. Lead and guide us into all truth, Holy Spirit. May we understand the depths, the width, and the breadth of your love for us. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Listen to me. Today, we're going to look at a couple of different levels of this. And I want you to stay focused with me if you can, because at first it's going to sound a bit on the morbid side. We're going to explore something that is a little morbid, a little morose even. But stay with me, because at the end, I promise, I'm going, to, I'm going to bring the hope. So, chapter 9, the book of Hebrews, starting in verse 15. The writer of Hebrews wrote, And for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Please give me your attention. He mentions the word death. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, we've been looking at the shadow, the picture, the foreshadowing of what the Old Testament was as compared to the New Testament. How the writer of Hebrews keeps referring back to the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus, and saying, listen, it's written there as a picture to you Jews, knowing that the book of Hebrews was written to these new converts that were Jews. It's all there. You don't have to abandon what you knew, but you have to let it die. I don't understand. How could you abandon and uh, not abandon it, but let it die? Stay with me. Just like your life, you got to let it die. Shocking statistic for you guys. It may freak some of you out. I don't. I don't want you to freak out. But in about 80 years, every single one of us will be dead. The 900 pound gorilla, there it is. I just introduced him. You're all gonna die. You do know that, right? Anybody not know that? Anybody? Oh, no, no, not me, I'm gonna live. Anthony, you do know that, right? Just, just checking. Sometimes you feel immortal. Stay with me, please keep that thought in mind. Remember, I told you I'm going somewhere. Continuing on, he says, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Please give me your attention here. He says this. If you write your will, the last will and testament, and I tell you, listen, when I die, I'm given whatever's left of whatever I have to my kids. They can split it, whatever, you know, whatever it is. They ain't getting it until I'm dead, though, are they? Here's what he's trying to declare. The promise that God offers to you, you only get it after he's dead. Well, he died and rose again. But the fullest of promises, now you only get till after you're dead. The Bible says to live is Christ, to die is gain. The Bible says... 1 Corinthians 15, 36, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive until it dies. It was William Wallace. <laughs> what? Who said, every man dies, not every man lives. It was Aragorn who said, <laughs> No, it wasn't Aragorn. It was somebody else. There was a girl in the movie. There was, was a girl in this movie who said, What do you fear? was asked of her. And she says, I don't fear death. So what do you fear? A cage. 
to live my life behind bars until all reason and attempt at valor is gone. That's what I'm afraid of. Today's message is about death and how some of us fear it, especially some of us that are, look, it's easy for a person like myself who sits there, a perfect model of health, as you can tell by looking at me. <laughs> oh yeah, you're hilarious. But some of you guys, you've got family, friends, maybe even yourself, and that C word has come up. The big C, they call it. Seems to be that's making a real resurgence. I don't know if it's just the age that I'm at or all of a sudden, I know hundreds of people. This one's got cancer, this, and, and not just like, this one's got lung cancer and they never smoked. This one's got pancreatic cancer. I, they, <coughs> they never drank. I mean, cancer. People are dying all around. And it, it, it reminds you of your mortality. Here, the apostle, or whoever it is that wrote the book of Hebrews, is saying, listen, death, it was uh, Gandalf who said, death is just another path, one that we all must take. Okay, I'm done with the movie references now. <laughs> Some of them are so good. Though. Verse 18. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law... <coughs> He took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Again, give me your attention. Looking back at the book of Exodus, when the priest was going in, he would have all the things set up. The lather was set up here. The Ark of the Covenant was setting there. And he'd have to go in with a bowl of blood. And he'd have to take his, his, uh, his finger and he'd dip it on this one. And then he'd take the other priest and he'd put it on an ear. And he'd have to dip everything in blood. Now, if you're reading this and you're new to Scripture and you're new especially to the Old Testament, you're like, ugh. What's with all the blood? Here we've understood, just by reading the last few weeks, all things that happened in the Old Testament were shadowed. They were a picture. They were a promise of what's to come so that the Jew can look and go, man, I can't believe it. He's the one. He's the one. He is the one. But, for us, why all the death? One thing God's got to break us of is death. Some of you guys here have been through the most horrible experience in the world, the death of a child. No parent should ever have to bury their kid. God's telling you. He's not died. She's not died. She's just moved. New residents, you'll see it again. You'll see him again. You'll see her again. For some of you guys, it's death that you've done that you can't undo. I'm talking about abortion. Some of you guys you know my testimony. If you've been here long enough, I've heard. I've been a part of too many of those. Growing up in New York, that was just what we did. And when coming to Christ and realizing that I couldn't add another sin to my list, I realized I'm in trouble deep because I'm going to stand before God and He's going to look at me and He's going to know. Matter of fact, I don't even want to stand before God so I'm going to run from Him as far and as fast as I can. And I'm going to do as horrible things so I never have to look Him face to face and have Him say, You did what? Because my picture of God was my, my daddy, my earthly dad. And unfortunately, my dad was one of those Italian, Sicilian fathers who, when you did something wrong, I mean, whether it was not throwing the garbage away or stealing a car and getting arrested, it was the same result. <laughs> you were getting a beating. 
So I was sure God was mad at me. And I was sure that as long as I was alive, I was going to live like death. Maybe some of you can understand what I'm saying. Verse 23. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Again, give me your attention. He came, fulfilled what the Old Testament said, putting to death the Old Testament. Not that the Old Testament was bad, not that the Old Testament didn't show the way, but you must let the Old Testament now die because it has been fulfilled. Now that doesn't mean we ignore it, it doesn't mean it's bad, but it dies to us. We can no longer live to the law because we found out through the Old Testament, we did this last week, I'll do it again just for poops and giggles. How many of you guys think that the Ten Commandments are good? I mean, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lie, honor thy mother and father, don't make a graven image. Yes, I think they're good. Okay, how many of you guys keep them? There you go. You can't do it. So then, there must be bad then. The Old Testament is bad because if they gave us Ten Commandments... If Moses, through God, gave Ten Commandments that we couldn't keep, then either we're tremendous failures, or God's not really that good. Because He put a stumbling block before us that we couldn't keep. Or, there's something better. That the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament, the law was given to us as proof we need a Savior. We need a Savior. The worst thing about coming to a church, especially for the first time, you may come here, you might be new to church, you might be new to the whole setting, and you look around and you see people who have happiness. You see that they have peace. And you think to yourself, here's the first thing you think to yourself if you're new. These people know. They're all perfect and I'm not. You come in here and you think, you're loaded down with sin. You're messed up. And these people, they have smiles on. <laughs> And they come in, they see each other, and they're hugging each other. And there's white folk, and black folk, and Hispanic folk, and Brazilian folk, and Asian folk. Look at all these people, they're all happy, and they know I'm dirt. I know, it's the same way I felt when I walked into church. And I'll tell you the honest truth. It's not that we're better. We just truly believe we're forgiven. We know this. You know why? Look, look again at verse 25, I think it was. I'm sorry, 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. You are forgiven, and now God goes into the very presence of the holiest of God, of the Father, who if you were to look at without the blood of Jesus upon you, you would just fall down and die because he's so holy. Let me be a little disgusting for the guys. You ever see a baby? You look at a little baby girl right out of the hospital and she's just cute and pudgy and perfect. You ever look at that baby and go, I want to have sex with her. Wait a second, Ryan, what are you talking to? Hey, I'm leaving. Listen to me. You see a holiness and you see a purity. You see something so special. And so even the most disgusting, perverted, sickest thought that could never enter your mind. Think about that now. God sees us. He doesn't think about that. He's so holy. He's so perfect. His thoughts are so true and so right, so righteous, that the very thoughts in your heart and your mind are immediately revealed when you get before a holy God and you go, don't look at me. You know, you know, you know. This is how some people come in here. 
He's so holy like that. So what happens is, God goes before you to God the Father, and He puts on glasses. And they're rose-colored, they're red-colored, they're blood-colored. So when He looks at you, He looks at you through the blood of His Son. And He doesn't see your filthiness, He doesn't see your... Some of you guys did horrible things last night, some maybe even this morning. And you think, I don't belong here, what am I even doing here? Listen, you're doing here what you're supposed to be doing here. Offering your life afresh to God. Giving God what He so wants more than anything else. Do you know what God wants more than anything else? You! He loves you! He just loves you. This is why these things were written beforehand. Give an example for me, and, and, and you're going to have to make some kind of application for yourself. When I first took my son to the gym, he was six years old, and he started doing jujitsu just about ten years ago now. And all these guys, these Brazilians, they would roll on the floor with my son dressed up in a gi with a black belt, you know, that uniform. And I thought to myself, looking at them, I was like, What's wrong with these guys? Who are they? What do they want? A little weird to me. Grown men rolling around with little... You know, what do they get out of this? And I started looking them up. It's great about the internet, right? Whoa. It's the same situation with God. I wonder, God, what do you want to do with me? Why would a, a world champion, fighter, competitor, some of the elite athlete in the world care about my six-year-old son? It's this incredible desire to share something so good. My trainer is a, a Junior Fernandez. He always says to me, Ryan, don't forget, jujitsu is for everyone. We get these people come to the gym and they're either really overweight or not athletic and, and they can't do the position, they can't do the movement. He always says to me, Ryan, jujitsu is for everyone. For everyone. It's good for everyone. And the application for me now looking back, and I want you to be able to apply this into something in your life. Listen to me. You're right. God has no reason to send His Son. Why would Jesus? Jesus had everything He needed, guys. He didn't need us. He had everything. He was in heaven with the Father. Things were perfect. Perfect. And He said, how can I make... It's, it's almost, and, and, and I say this complete humility, I mean no disrespect to the Lord, and I say it's almost like God's a drama king. Let me have some drama in my life. Let me call Ryan. And I look at you. You don't want me, God. Uh, no, I've made a complete mess of my life. God, you don't know what. Oh, God, you don't. And God's like, no, no, come on. And he rolls around on the mat with me and he messes with me. And every time I mess up, he goes, no, 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 that's going to cost you. What are you talking about? That's arm bar. Don't ever put your hands over the top when you're rolling. Why not? You get arm barred. Oh. Well, don't ever. <coughs> Don't ever sleep with the dude until he says, I do. Why? You're going to get armbarred. Well, what happens when you get armbarred in jiu-jitsu? You tap. And you know what he does? He lets go. Whew. Now try again. That's the greatest thing about the Lord. At no point in time do you get armbarred by God and he goes, That's the last time. He broke my arm. God says, no, no. Um, I'm going to walk you through the rest of this too. You tap yet? I tap, I tap. Okay, come on, let's do it together. Okay. And then you walk with God together and you get into some stupid financial situation. And you get triangled. And you tap. And he lets go again. You want to go again? 
I'm really bad at this life thing. And he goes, it's okay. I'm going to do it with you. Now, I want you to, now, for some of you guys, especially you athletes, you're, you're, you're like, man, I'm feeling it, Ryan. If you're not an athlete and you don't understand what I'm saying, look, try to apply whatever way you can. It, it, the, the visual, the, the... There's nothing you can do to stop God from loving you. Even hating Him, He loves you the more. I tell this to people all the time. And they say, well, I don't believe in God. And I go, well, He believes in you. I don't want God to love me because God really knows what I've done. If there is a God, then He really knows what I've done and I don't want to go before Him. And Don't worry. Why? Verse 24 again. Because He appears in the presence of God for us. Continuing, verse 25. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he's appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Again, give me your attention. Once a year, the priest would go into the Holy of Holy. The first thing he'd have to do is sacrifice for himself. He'd have to open up everything all over again, every Every year, sometimes it's a new priest, offer sacrifice first for himself, then for the people. Imagine if I had to come before you every single week sinless. Oh, after the week I've had, forget about it. I'm in my office and I'm sacrificing a goat, a lamb, an ox. Forget it. I'm in my office, looks like a butchery, you know, but I'm okay. I come out here. He said, it's not like that with the Lord. And you have to know that this is super, super important. He offered himself once for all. He doesn't need to offer himself. And what's the, what's the, for us, listen to me. He said it on the cross, the very last words. Anybody? It's finished. It's finished. You are free. Oh, no, I ain't free because you should have seen what I did this week. Yeah, guess what? Then you did it with your freedom. And the greatest thing about stepping in the bear trap of sin is that God's always there to go like this. Get your foot out. Get up. Go on. No, no, I'm really stuck. I've really made a mess in my life. No, you haven't. God's going to clean it up. Take your foot out of the bear trap. I'll never forget. Never. I remember the first time it happened. And I was walking with the Lord and I thought I was doing pretty good and I got myself into a couple of situations financially. I had done some stupid stuff. I had imported some animals out of, out of um, South America. I, was, I had this farm in El Salvador and I'd gone to this mess. Man, Christians aren't supposed to do this. I don't know what I'm going to do now. I'm in deep. And a brother said, why don't you just get out of it? What, what do you mean? Just don't do it. Call up the guy, cancel, and tell him, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. I remember going, yeah, why don't I just do that? And that's what I'm going to tell you here. I don't know what mess you made of your life. I don't know. Don't stay in the mess. No matter what it is, what the enemy meant for evil, God can turn around for good. Amen. You are not stuck in your sin. It's been a long time, so I'll do this analogy because a lot of you guys haven't heard it. But you guys have been coming to our church know it. The way they train elephants at the zoo is by taking a giant stake and nailing it in the ground with a chain and they put it around the elephant's foot. You guys might have seen the old... And the elephant goes in circles and he just walks in circles and he walks in circles and he walks in circles. So much a picture of us. There we are, staked to the ground. We're stuck to the earth and we just walk in circles and walk in circles. After a while, guys, and this is the truth, this is reality, they cut the chain and the stupid elephant doesn't know that he's free. He never leaves his circle. He just keeps going around and going around and going around. Is that you? 
Let me tell you something. Your chains are gone. You've been set free. Get out. Walk away from that circle. I'm not telling you things. This is not like a life coach class lesson. I'm not some motivational speaker. This is not what this is. This is the truth of God's word. You've been set free. Continuing and finishing the chapter. And as he had appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Listen. You only got to die once. Great comedian on TV I heard the other day. He said, you know what the greatest thing about being a human is? Humans are the only species on the earth that don't die going, ah! Every other species on earth, they get eaten when they die. They get shot, they get eaten, they get torn to shreds. You're just going to die once. Most of you are probably going to die in front of your family, in a bed somewhere, hopefully reaching out to the Lord, reaching out. And then you live forever. You're going to move. Keep that thought in mind. Please turn to Luke, a few pages to the left, to Luke chapter 12. Is where we're going to finish. Luke chapter 12. And the reason I'm going here is I want you to understand something. That the enemy of your soul, Satan the devil, wants you to be defeated. He wants you dead before your heart stops beating. He wants you useless and fruitless. He wants you to know you can't do nothing for God because of what you've done. Sometimes in a relationship, now this one's free, and this is a good one. Listen, guys, listen, guys, you got to promise me you're not going to do this. I don't want you ladies going like this, and I don't want you men going like this now. But sometimes in relationships, a husband and wife so many wrongs they heap upon their own heart toward their spouse that no matter what the spouse does, they automatically have a reason to be mad at them for nothing. Well, I can't believe you said that to me. Well, if you wouldn't have said that to me, I wouldn't have said that to you. It's like all personal excuses are now already in place. All personal responsibility is gone. No matter what your man does, no matter what your wife does, you've already got the built-in story of why it's okay for you to do what you already did, what you know you shouldn't have did. Now, if you're not married, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But if you're married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this is what happens with the enemy. The enemy wants you to know what a mess up you are. Oh, stop making believe you're so righteous and holy. Cut it out. Oh now, oh, now you're going to tell the guy, God bless you. Oh, that's great. I saw what you did. You know what you did. Oh, now, oh, now you're going to be a Christian? That's great. When you got nothing left. Now, now all of a sudden you're going to be a Christian, huh? Now, oh, you've made a mess of your life. Now you're going to go to God. Yeah, you go ahead and go to God. You see, you know what they're going to do at that church when you get there? They're all going to look at you. They're going to judge you. Just like they did at the other church you went to. You remember when you went to a church when you were a little kid? And everybody was such a hypocrite, and you had to sit there and you hated it. Same situation is going to happen. But now you're going to go to church. Everybody's going to know you're full of it. Like everybody in your family knows you're full of it. Everybody knows everywhere you go that you're full of it. We've seen what you did. Your family abandoned you. You're, oh, so, you have a, you, so now that you've screwed everybody else's life up, you're going to go to church. Hey guys, all those things that I just said, they're not of God. That's the voice of the enemy condemning you, trying to make you 
fruitless. Because if God could take a criminal like me and use him to preach his word and to be so honored and blessed to see God do an amazing work. I just look around and look at some of your guys' lives and just to... Just, I'm in wonder at the things that God's done in your lives. I'm just, God let me be a part of it. If He can do that, He can do it with you. If you let Him. Another jujitsu reference. I used to have an old teacher. His name was Shark. He used to say, you know what a black belt is? That's a white belt that never quit. You know what a pastor is? That's a sinner who never stopped asking God to forgive him. Chapter 12, pick it up in verse 13 of the book of Luke. Then one from the crowd said to him, speaking to the Lord Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Listen, some guy says to the Lord Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother he needs to share the inheritance that he got from our parents with me. And the Lord Jesus, so much destroying everybody's opinion of who he was. You know how the world, you know, if you ask the world, if you ask people who never read the Bible, if you ask... Goodness sakes, if you ask most people, what do you think the Lord Jesus would say if he said that to them? Imagine, take somebody who never read the Bible, somebody who's not in this, and said, hey, listen, some guy comes to the Lord Jesus and says, hey, can you please tell my brother to share my family inheritance with me? What do you think he'd say? The world would say, well, of course, you must divide it even. I mean, what would the world say that the Lord Jesus should say? The reality of who he is is so different than the reality of the, what people think. You know, he said, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Are oh, you going to make me judge and arbitrator? Well, then get right, sit, sit right down there. I got a better idea. Why don't you let yourself be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and you can judge for yourself? No, I want a quick fix. Pastor Ryan, can you help me with my situation? Absolutely. Can we meet at church? You know, uh... Uh, I work on Sunday. We're, we Wednesday? I'm busy. Can we go to lunch? Who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? I mean, I'm certainly not saying I'm in the place of the Lord Jesus, but listen to me. I can introduce you to someone who can give you wisdom for every situation in your life. He wants to fill your life with nothing but good things. Plan A. Man, when I tell you I can introduce you to this guy, you won't need me, not even for a second. All you need to do is look to the Word, look to prayer, and God will give you all the counsel you need. I had to introduce you to Him. I'm really busy right now. Can you just tell me if my brother should split the inheritance with me or not? You notice what the Lord said? Nothing. He didn't try to explain. Wait, wait, before you go away, take this pamphlet. Wait, wait, before you leave. Let... He said to them a parable. He said a parable. A parable. For you guys that are new to Scripture, a parable is an earthly story depicting a heavenly principle. It's an earthly story depicting a heavenly principle. Continuing, he says, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store my crops and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool! This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Please, give me your attention again. You got one life, Jack. One. One life to live. Many mistakes to make. One life to live. 
Live it until you breathe your last with everything you got. Go after it with everything. If you are an athlete, do everything you can do to be the best athlete you possibly can without forgetting it's God who gives you the strength. If you're a mom, be the best mom you could possibly be with everything that is in you knowing that God will give you strength to be the best. If you're a salesperson, if you are an insurance, if no matter what, truck driver, uh, carpet cleaner, um, garbage collecting, name it. You can be the best you could possibly be with God on your side. Everything that you do. And then when you beat your last, you breathe your last. God says, enter into your father's rest. How awesome is this? Are you feeling this yet? Death. Death. It sits before you. Close your Bible. One of the Caesars wrote, Death smiles at us all. The best we can do is smile back. You know how many people are afraid of death? They're afraid to die. I'm not afraid to die. I'm afraid not to live. I'm not afraid to die. I'm afraid not to worship God while I'm here. You fool! What about all the stuff you got? Have you not used it for God's glory? Have you not given Him the... Have you not given Him the respect? Have you not given Him His credit? Have you not given Him His due? What are you going to do with all that stuff? My pastor used to always say, if has anybody ever seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it? Guys, would you hand out the uh, communion elements? We're going to do communion, and here's what I want you to do today. If, if your constant worry and your constant fear has been death, I want you to use this time for communion to dedicate your, your life to using from today everything God's placed in your life. If you could be a pregnant woman here, and we got a few pregnant ladies here, and you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, Man, I'm, I'm pregnant, what could I do for God? Oh, goodness. There's other sisters around you that need help. God, you can hand them out. If you're a... have a baby growing inside your belly what a, what a promise of hope Brianna what a promise of hope that lies within you what a promise of hope Brianna what a promise man you could take that baby and you could say this baby there's a woman in the Bible named Hannah and she said, while the baby was in her belly, God, this is your child. All the days of his life, he will serve you. And that man that grew from that turned out to be the greatest prophet of all time, Samuel, who paved the way for David, who, who served God all his life. What can you do? You're uh, handicapped. Oh, you know... Nobody will listen to me. <laughs> I tell you, the person I know in my life who's caused the greatest influence over the others is Sabrina. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Pay attention. There's nobody that's ever met Sabrina, that's nobody's ever seen Sabrina, that has said to her, God bless you. Remember my father used to weep. My father used to weep when he saw Sabrina. She used to, she, she was born with spina bifida and she, she, her legs don't work as good as some of you guys' legs. And she used to get on one of the chairs at, at the gym and she used to scoot all and she used to have her, her, uh, her um, crutch in one hand and she'd be 
going all over the gym with it, bouncing off the walls. And my father, oh, I love that girl, man. Nothing, nothing can stop you. The Bible says that God's chosen the foolish things of the world, the weak things of the world, the base things of this world to confound the wise. Whether it's sin or fear, today make a commitment to God that no longer is anything going to stop you from serving Him. Nothing. And what's great about it, especially for the crowd that we have here today, is every single place you're at. Look, she's not here today, but we got this girl that comes to church sometimes and she's a dancer. She dances up north in a bar. And she, she says, I just, I can't get out of it. I make too much money. And I just, I tell her this. Love Jesus. That's all. I don't tell her to get out of that life. And God can use you anywhere. God will pull you out when he needs you. Well, you know, I, I like really smoking dope. And I know a church, they don't really let you smoke dope. Listen, I tell people, say, smoke all the dope you want. Makes no difference to me. Smoke as much herb as you want to smoke. But here's what I'm going to ask you. Read the word, pray, and come to church. I don't care if you come here high every day. Just let the word dwell in you richly. And then watch what happens to your life. You ever think potheads don't need Jesus too? You think fighters don't need Jesus? Well, you know, God doesn't like people who punch other people in the face. Yeah, I heard. I heard. I'm in big trouble. Again. have been set let me make that clearer we have been set free I want you to celebrate your freedom with two things before you take communion I'm going to let Leah play a song I want you turn the lights down a little bit I want you to just do two things with God not three things the first thing is if you don't know Jesus your Savior just tell God he's yours and you're his perfect tell God he's yours I just if you've never accepted Christ your Savior this is your time before you take communion you say God I'm yours I'm yours that's it I'm done with this other nonsense I'm yours that's fine too the second thing I want you to do is tell yourself could you just make that a little lighter because it's kind of bugging me out I don't want it to be that dark perfect the second thing I want you to do is tell yourself you're free. Because the most, the vast majority of Christians don't believe they're free because of how stuck they are in their sin. And then the third thing I want you to do is celebrate your freedom. Make yourself a promise, I'm never going back to that again. It's not going to hold me anymore. Not because Ryan said it with passion and quoted a bunch of movies, because the Word of God said it. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Okay. Don't partake. We'll partake together and celebrate together. Miss Leah, would you please play? Lord, I will see you on my bed.
Bible says that death worketh in us. The Bible says that though the outward man be perishing, inwardly the spiritual man is being renewed day by day. I told you I was going to bring it all together in the end. We're all dying. We're all dying. It is what choice we make to do with that death. We could keep living while we die, or we could sit around and feel sorry for ourselves. The Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, just days before he died, he sat his apostles, he sat his followers down, those closest to him, and he said, listen to me. This is my body. It's about to be broken for you so that you can live and not fear death, not fear chains. You will be free. For if I die, I can live in every one of you. Lord Jesus said, if I die, the Holy Spirit can come and abide in every single one of you. So I'm going. I'm going to the cross to die so that you may live. You better live then. You gotta live. You gotta live every single day with a mission to bring people to the kingdom. Every single day to get closer, to bring our, our wives or husbands or children or friends or family closer to live. As, as I was talking to Marcos this week about salt and light. Salt, being salt and light. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that you got to go out and wear a sandwich sign and go turn or burn. Everybody except Jesus or you go to hell. But living like people go... Something different about you isn't there. Maybe it's the way you do business. Maybe it's the way you talk. Maybe it's the choices you make where people go... You're salty. What's different about you? Salt and light. And here's how. His life in your life becoming a part of you. The reality of what we're doing now, it's symbolic, just like the Old Testament was symbolic. He didn't do away with allegory and symbols. This is an allegory. Symbols, obviously, it's a piece of bread. It's not his, his body. But you're declaring before everybody else, and more importantly, before God, God, I want your life in my life. I know I ain't done it right. So, if you're serious, and this is what you want, go ahead, take his life in your life. he said to his apostles that same night well you've made the choice for my life and your life I've broken my body I allow my body to be broken for you but we still have one thing to deal with your sin so I'm going to bake a new covenant a cup of the new covenant that from now on when you sin I'll forgive you 1 John 1 9 He is faithful to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All you got to do is ask. You become Teflon. Like a Teflon coated pen. Because here's what's going to happen guys. Before we partake of the representation of his blood. Some of you guys are going to make a serious commitment here. I spoke with enough passion and told enough of my story that some of you guys are like, yes, yes, you're leaving here, yes, that's my life from now on. And you're going to wake up tomorrow and the reality of what situation you're in is going to hit you all over again. And the enemy is going to call you and he's going to go, come on back, come on here. Something's going to happen to your life. And 
the temptation to seize you will be all over again. I felt so good yesterday. Don't worry. Don't worry. This seals the deal. Don't be like the stupid elephant. You're free. And the things I'm telling you, just because you don't believe them, don't make them any less true. He said so. He said so in his word. I'm just affirming it. You're free. You're free from cigarettes. Throw them out. You're free from booze. Throw it out. You're free from cheating. Let it go. You're free. Whatever it is that you think really binds you. Fear. Financial burden. Some of you guys, no matter how much money you make, it's never enough. You're free from that today. Because God's word says so. You're free. Do you believe it? Then seal it by the power of the New Testament, which is in his blood. And let nobody discourage you from here on out. You're free. Partake. Would you please celebrate with me a song? Hail Jesus, you're my king. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life leads me to sing. Your life leads me to sing. I will praise you all my day. I will praise you all my day. Perfect in all your ways. Perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. I will obey your word. I will Wanna see your kingdom come? Not my will, but yours be done. Glory, glory to the Lamb. You take me into this land. We will conquer in your name. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. Hail, hail, line of Judah. How wonderful you are. Hail, hail, line of Judah. How powerful you are. Hail, hail, line of Judah. What was the last line of that movie by William Wallace? Freedom! Walk in it.